Okay, welcome uh, this evening to our joint uh, Manchester Classical Association and Manchester Centre for Public History and Heritage paper, where we're very pleased to welcome Dr. Sam Kwamu uh, from Royal Holloway University of London, who uh, is a Leverhulme Early Career Fellow uh, researching there in the Classics Department. He's an expert in Latin literature and its reception in, in later periods, and he focuses largely on the constructions of the classical tradition and roles within the projects, uh, later projects of nationalism, imperialism, and ideologies of race. His current project is dealing with the afterlife of Petrarch's neo-Latin epic, uh, the Africa, and his work is the first full study of this epic, highlighting the transmission of ancient ideas about Africa into the early modern and modern eras. I'll let him tell you about that rather than me talk about it. He has a monograph in progress, uh, uh, fully underway from his PhD thesis undertaken at KCL uh, on uh, Italy's use of the history of Roman imperialism in Africa in the 19th centuries. And he's published quite widely around these topics. And he's going to talk to us this evening on is race in a theme in Petrarch's Africa and why does it matter? <clears throat> thank you so much for the introduction and thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm really looking forward to sharing some ideas that are very much at fairly preliminary stages with you today and be very grateful for your feedback or comments afterwards. So as I began putting together ideas for this paper, news was coming in of the Italian general election in which it seemed that the far right or the right wing coalition would sweep centre left coalition uh, away and come into power. Subsequently, Giorgia Maloney, who you see on the left here, um, and she's the leader of the Gods of Italy party, the heirs of, fascist, uh, of the Italian fascist party, was inaugurated just last weekend to become Italy's first female prime minister. Maloney in the past has voiced uh, xenophobic, homophobic and transphobic sentiments, although she seems to be presenting a more moderate face, at least for now. The timing of this new phase of Italian politics is remarkable. Later this week also sees the centenary of the March on Rome, the event which saw Mussolini's fascist party, which you see in the top right there, come into power in 1922. And uh, in 1925, um, Mussolini went from being a partner in the government to become the fascist dictator of Italy. <clears throat> it's against this backdrop of renaissance xenophobia and outright fascism in Italy and elsewhere that I turn to look at an epic by an Italian poet which enjoyed perhaps its greatest popularity subsequent to its publication in the 14th century under fascism in the 1920s and 30s. The links between fascism with its concomitant nationalism, imperialism and racism and Petrarch's Africa are not to be taken for granted, they're not coincidental. Today, I'll be exploring with you some ideas why this might be the case. But first, I want to take a step back and ask a, perhaps a very obvious question. Who are we? Maybe before such a question can be answered, I need to reframe it or give it slightly different emphasis. Who are we? Who are the we of this question? Presumably we're here because we share some interest in history or literature, but I think it would be a stretch to find our common identity, if indeed we have one, along the lines of our academic interests. <clears throat> Surely we ought to define, uh, we ought to avoid defining an us along the lines of nationality, religion, political beliefs, etc., because that would open up all sorts of fragmentations and would also be deeply problematic for all sorts of reasons. What about something nice and uncontroversial? What about if we define ourselves along the, fact, along the lines of the fact that we are all human? After all, we are indeed all hu human, I, I assume, um, or identify as such. But this leads us into another trap. Predictably, the next question would be, what is the human? Now, I'm going to appeal to that well-worn cliche that this problem is beyond the scope of the paper. Um, but I will try to make a case today for the importance of humanism in the original Renaissance connotation um, within historical constructions of the human. Such constructions of the human are, I suggest, tightly bound up with discourses of race. I'm going to try to show you this by homing in on the important text of Renaissance humanism, the Africa. This is a nine book Latin epic written by the Italian poet Petrarch in the 14th century. It's a poem about the Second Punic War, a conflict fought between the Roman Republic and Carthage, a city state in what is now uh, Tunisia which raged between 218 and 201 BCE. For much of its life, from its posthumous publication in 1397 until the late 19th century or early 20th century, the poem was more or less marginalized in Renaissance and Italian literary studies, as well as in classics and neo-Latin studies. 
So why then am I here to talk to you about this fairly marginal uh, poem and why do I make the claim that it is a significant poem in Renaissance humanism? I'll begin by sketching out who Petrarch was and why he's important to the history of humanism. Then I'll turn to his Latin epic, the Africa itself, to argue for its underestimated importance in Petrarch's humanist project. I'll suggest that the idea of race lurks under the surface of Petrarch's text, and for this reason, that this idea of race sits also at the foundations of, Rome, uh, of Renaissance humanism and the attitude of modernity which humanism is credited with ushering, ushering in. So who then was Petrarch, the author of this epic of questionable quality? Francesco Petrarca, known in English as Petrarch, was an Italian poet and humanist scholar. Although most of what he wrote was in Latin, he's perhaps best known today for his Italian lyric poetry. Petrarch was born in Arezzo in Tuscany in 1304. In 1311, his family moved to Avignon in France, where the papacy was at, the, at that time located. In 1316, Petrarch, at the behest of his father, reluctantly began to study law in Montpellier in France and then moved to continue his studies in Bologna in Italy in 1323. He returned to Avignon after the death of his father in 1326, and it was during this stint back in Avignon that he discovered his love for uh, Roman antiquity. While working for the Cardinal Giovanni Colonna in the 1330s, Petrarch travelled all over France, Belgium and uh, Germany on official business, but also used this as an opportunity to scour monastic libraries for manuscripts of classical texts. Among these were parts of the work of the Roman historian Livy, who was central to Petrarch's understanding of Roman history. In 1337, Petrarch visited Rome, and this, uh, uh, visited Rome for the first time and described in a letter to a friend being utterly amazed by what he, what he saw. It was likely this experience which moved him to write two of his major Latin works, his anthology of biographies of famous men from biblical and classical antiquity, his De Weiris Illustribus, or about famous men, and his epic of the Second Punic War, the Africa. And it was for the Africa that he claims to have won the Laurel Crown in 1341, but I'll come on to that in a second. But why did Petrarch choose to write his epic poem that he saw as his great masterpiece on the Second Punic War? For Roman authors, the war against Hannibal was a watershed moment in Roman Republican history. The Roman historian Livy had referred to it as the most memorable of all wars, uh, due in large part to the huge resources of both sides, their mutual hatred, and the uncertain outcome of the conflict, as he describes in the opening of Book 21, uh, which is the beginning of his account of the Second Punic War. Hannibal had invaded the Italian peninsula, inflicted a series of devastating losses against Roman armies, chief among which was at Cannae, and threatened the walls of Rome itself. Scipio responded to Hannibal's incursion by leading an invasion of Africa, forcing the Carthaginian Senate to recall Hannibal and to meet Scipio's assault. Scipio defeated Hannibal at the Battle of Zama in 202 BCE, leading to Rome's ultimate victory in the Second Punic War. Although this was not the end of the conflicts between Rome and Carthage, the war against Hannibal was the most dramatic and saw the most stunning Roman victory. The Third Punic War, by contrast, fought around 50 years later, saw Scipio's adopted grandson destroy a much weakened and almost defensive Carthage defenseless Carthage in 146 BCE. This was, in contrast to the glorious victory of Zama, a conquest imbued with ambivalence and melancholy. This younger Scipio, Scipio Aemilianus, is said to have wept over the ruins of Carthage, according to Philippius, seeing in the destruction of the African city a premonition of, the, uh, of Rome's own eventual inevitable fate. Unlike this final conflict, the Second Punic War, culminating in a stunning Roman victory on African soil, served as an ideal subject for an epic of Roman revival. Not only this, but Petrarch, as a philologist, is responsible for much of the reconstruction of Livy on the Second Punic War. But, uh, and for this, uh, for the Second Punic War, Petrarch was able to rely on Livy, whereas some parts of Livy about the Third Punic War uh, weren't available to Petrarch. As, for, as a result of his cultivation of classical Latin, Petrarch is frequently seen as, if not a founder of humanism, then at least very important in its development. If we take later Renaissance humanists at their word, it would seem fairly uncontroversial to suggest that Petrarch is a figure of fundamental importance for the period or intellectual movement known as the Renaissance. And while numerous scholars of the Renaissance, since Roberto Weiss, have complicated ideas of Petrarch's primacy in the humanist project, we can't ignore the novelty of what Petrarch was doing in the eyes of his close contemporaries and successors. 
So what was it, according to these Renaissance humanists, that made Petrarch such a pathbreaker in their intellectual tradition? For giants of 14th and 15th century humanism, such as Leonardo Bruni, Flavio Biondo, and Padre Bracciolini, it was Petrarch's revival of classical models in poetry that made him special. The Africa was singled out as a key text in such appraisals of Petrarch's contribution to humanism. The early Renaissance encyclopedist Domenico Bandini, for example, referred to the Africa as, and I quote, an outstanding book put together with admirable skill. However, at the time of Bandini's writing, it had not yet been published. A 14th century biographer of Petrarch, Pietro de Castelletto, and uh, the early Renaissance uh, chronicler Filippo Villani all write about the Africa in a similar tone, situating it as chief among Petrarch's works. Perhaps the most significant of the Africa's early admirers was Giovanni Boccaccio, author of Decameron, and the third, chronologically the third of Italy's three literary crowns after Dante and Petrarch himself. Boccaccio even wrote a poem addressed to the Africa after Petrarch's death and close to his own. In this, he bemoans the poem's unpublished status and refers to the Africa as Petrarch's daughter. Boccaccio further views the epic as, and I quote, the honor of Italy, end quote, um, and an uh, ideal vehicle for Italian national uh, resurgence, or proto-national resurgence. Despite all of this, there is no clear indication that Boccaccio had even read any of the Africa. Uh, the only part of the epic to have circulated during Petrarch's own lifetime was the section of the sixth book, and it was only in 1397 that the poem, still incomplete, was published in the form that we have, more or less in the form we have of it today, and this being a whole two decades after Boccaccio's own death. <clears throat> However, the Africa did not meet with the unanimous praise among Renaissance humanists that, uh, we, that people like Boccaccio might give us the impression of was. Writing soon after the Africa's publication, Leonardo Bruni relates the words of his fellow humanist, Niccolo Niccoli, who made fun of Petrarch for being so obsessed with his own poem. Niccoli wonders that Petrarch did not have a friend to tell him not to bother writing the epic, or once he had already written it, not to have burnt it, as Petrarch um, pre uh, pretended that he planned to do with the epic in emulation of Virgil, who apparently wanted the Aeneid to be burnt after his death. Yet, according to uh, Niccolo Niccoli, there could not be a greater difference in between Virgil's Aeneid and Petrarch's Africa. Where the Aeneid had made obscure men illustrious, the Africa had taken an illustrious man, Scipio Africanus, and made him obscure. Well, so much for the Renaissance reception of the Africa. Why does this matter? What I hope to have shown so far is uh, Petrarch's importance to Renaissance humanism and the pride of place afforded to the Africa in such a process of Petrarch, in, in such um, assessments of Petrarch's contribution. If therefore we are to take seriously what humanists say about uh, humanism, then we have to look more closely at the Africa, even if it has been or had been gathering dust on bookshelves across Europe for a good half millennium of its lifetime. But you may ask, what does race have to do? So the title of my presentation riffs on a recent paper given by Joseph Farrell, a professor of classics at the University of Pennsylvania. He presented at a Virgil conference uh, in summer 22, 2022, a paper with the title, Is Race a Theme in the Aeneid? I'm going to be differing from Professor Farrell's approach in a number of respects, not least the fact that I'm looking at a totally different epic, albeit one which heavily emulates Virgil's Aeneid. Firstly, Professor Farrell focuses on representations of Ethiopians in the Aeneid. This leads to interpretations that race in the Aeneid is largely structured along the idea of phenotype, observable, observable biological traits, such as uh, skin color. Uh, there are various diverse peoples in the Aeneid that cannot be characterized solely on the basis of skin color. And skin color plays little part in Petrarch's own race. Secondly, I'll put my hands up and say that perhaps whether or not race is a theme in Petrarch's Africa may not be of importance or significance in itself but has much wider implications for the development of early modern European race thinking. So at this point, it might be useful for me to sketch out what I mean when I talk about race. Race, in the words of Michael Omi and Howard Renand in their important 18, uh, 1986 work, Racial Formation in the United States, is, and I quote, a way of making up people. It's socially, uh, it's socially constructed and its contours shift through time and space, end quote. This process of racialization involves making people other, which in turn justifies stru structural oppression, expropriation, and or extermination. And while race is frequently tied up with the so-called phenotype, these 
observable biological traits such as skin color, hair texture, or uh, the shape of facial features. Phenotypes are historically mutable and shift in meaning through social life and through history. Generally speaking, race as we understand it today is considered a modern phenomenon arising during the Enlightenment. For example, Omi and Winant see Christian hostility towards Jewish people and Muslims as distinct from racial formations, uh, since these were antagonisms structured along religious rather than racial lines. Scholars of race and decoloniality see 1492 with Columbus's so-called discovery of the Americas, as well as the conclusion of the Spanish Reconquista, as a decisive rupture in race thinking. The so-called discovery of the native peoples of the Americas led Europeans to consider what it meant to be human and to consider the nature of difference between humans. The European Christian humanist man took center stage as the idealized universal human against which, uh, against which all others were unfavorably measured. Thus, for this developing conception of racial difference to take hold, hum humanism had to have already attained an almost hegemonic status as the exemplary intellectual, cultural, and political movement in Europe. And we've already seen the centrality of Petrarch and his Africa in humanism self narration. Petrarch's writing, with the Africa as a case study, complicates the idea of race emerging from the rupture of 1492. For a while now, scholars working in pre-modern critical race studies have taken apparatuses for thinking about race in contemporary society and adapted them for use for the pre-modern world. As Denise Mikoski, a classicist with an expertise on race in the classical world, proposes, studying race in the ancient world helps to shed light on race in the present. And should we maintain the idea that to apply such labels as race to pre-modernity is anachronistic, we can surely agree with the Congolese philosopher and former classical uh, scholar B.Y. Madimbi, who suggests that even if modern racism began in the 18th and 19th centuries, there was still a long history of race thinking stretching back to long before them. In short, Madimbi suggests there was never a time before race or racism. What I hope to do with the Africa is to suggest, to suggest that while this may be the case, we can go even further than to accept a pre-modern race thinking and trace the roots of elements of modern racism in Petrarch's discourses of otherness. The idea of race in Petrarch's wider corpus is multifaceted and polyvalent. Most of his prejudices are indeed religious or proto-national. He's a staunch Catholic with a vehement hostility towards Jewish and Muslim people, as well as towards Greek Orthodox Christians. He's also passionately anti-French, in part due to the papacy's move to Avignon, which Petrarch and many of his con uh, contemporary uh, Italian contemporaries viewed as an abandonment of Rome, which they viewed as the Eternal City. However, his general anti-Frenchness is not without exception, as his ad admiration for the Angevin uh, king Robert of Naples uh, illustrates. And it helps that uh, Robert of Naples was the, the monarch who sponsored Petrarch's Africa and uh, encouraged him to seek the laurel crown of Rome. At times, Petrarch is also prejudiced against Germans, although in one letter to a friend, he expresses surprise that the people of Cologne are actually much cleaner than he thought they would be. Perhaps he could explain this to himself by pointing to the Roman origins of this German city, which he was also at pains to point out in this same letter. This, of course, does not amount to race thinking or racism. However, religion and proto-nationalism -nation uh, are important ingredients, I'll suggest, for Petrarch's race thinking in ways that I now turn on to address. So now that I've laid the ground for Petrarch's significance for race, uh, for Renaissance humanism, and why I think Petrarch is important for discussions of the development of race, now I finally turn to the poem itself. In order to think about race in the Africa, I'll focus on two key moments from the epic. The Africa is composed of nine books, and I'll home in on books two and book uh, on book two and book five. In the first two books, Scipio Africanus on campaign in Africa is visited in a dream by the spirits of his, uh, of his uncle, Publius Cornelius, sorry, uh, his father, Publius Cornelius, and his uncle, Gnaeus Cornelius. Both his father and his uncle had earlier been killed by St. Carthage during the Second World War. The sequence of the Africa is based closely on the final books of Cicero's De Republica. Cicero's version of Scipio's dream was widely read in the Middle Ages thanks to Macrobius' sixth century commentary on it. This, uh, in uh, Macrobius provides a Neoplatonist analysis of the symbolism of Scipio's dream. In Petrarch's version of the dream, uh, Scipio's um, father and his uncle assure, Pet uh, assure Scipio of his uh, coming victory over uh, Hannibal. 
They take Scipio up to the heavens and explain to him the eternal rewards for those who die for their homeland. In the second book, Scipio's father shows him the future triumphs of Rome, which will follow Scipio's defeat of Hannibal. This parade of imperial victories provides Petrarch with the opportunity to fashion an Italian national and, I hope to argue, racial identity in opposition to Rome's enemies, who are made to resemble both Italy's and the Catholic Church's enemies. These dynamics of historical trans, trans historical identifications are made possible, I suggest, through developing technologies of race. Petrarch is able to link Rome's imperial conquests to his contemporary context by representing them as crusades. Geraldine Heng, in her work on the invention of race in the European Middle Ages, suggests that the Crusades were an important series of events in medieval racial formation. During the First Crusade, the idea of, a Christian, uh, of Christian blood being spilled in the Holy Land contributed to the, uh, contributed the formation of a European Christian identity. Christians were defined as blood brothers and Christendom by implication of blood fraternity. This is as much the case for, sp for spilling blood as for having one's own Christian blood being spilled. As Christians took up the terms of race and blood to describe their group identity, the cruel Muslim enemy dripping in the blood of Christians became a blood enemy. Similarly, Christians spilling non-Christian blood reinforced the blood brotherhood of the killers. Petrarch was a vocal proponent for a renewed crusade to the Holy Land, a commitment that shines through especially clearly when he writes about Rome's conquests in the Eastern Mediterranean. In this respect, Pompey takes up a significant amount of space in the future triumphs of Rome, which are shown to Scipio Africanus in his dream. In Scipio's dream, Scipio's father, Publius Cornelius, casts the Roman military commander and politician Pompey as a proto-crusader. Pompey, who lived from, the, from 106 to 48 BCE, was the rival of Julius Caesar, and um, uh, by whom he was defeated at Fars, uh, Pharsalus in 48 BCE. However, prior to this disastrous conflict, Pompey had expanded Roman control in the Eastern Mediterranean. Publius Cornelius tells his son that Pompey will clear the Mediterranean of pirates, conquer what he describes as southern, southern Judea, so Judea Tenax, uh, as well as the two Armenias, Cappadocia, Arabia, and the broad Ganges, in addition to Persia and the Arsacides, Parthian rulers of Armenia. All of these places, save the Ganges, are places that are closely related to the geography of the Crusades to the Holy Land, or with Christianity's Muslim enemy in general. Pomp's expansion of Roman power sets the foundations for the spread of Christendom, which will exceed the bounds um, of the Roman Empire. This is an idea which Petrarch frequently emphasizes, citing the Church Fathers Augustine and Ambrose in similar points. This wide expanse of Christendom brought it into inevitable conflict with the Mediterranean's other major monotheisms, represented by Judea, um, Arabia, Persia, and others in Publius Cornelius's implicit Christianization of Pompey. In Scipio's dream, after Pompey comes Caesar. Publius Cornelius describes Caesar as filling Gaul with terror, violating its rivers and waves with blood. And again, we recall the role of blood in the formation of, uh, of Christian, of an idea of. Christian of the Christian race in Geraldine Heng's work. And um, Caesar is also described as trampling Britain in war. We also read about the violence that he visits upon the blue-eyed Germans. This is interesting for a number of reasons. Firstly, it introduces the idea of uh, identity formed, at least in part, on the basis of observable biological traits, here being blue eyes. Of course, this is a fairly unremarkable epithet, which need not necessarily amount to racialization. However, there are a number of important factors which suggest that we can read this as an element of racial formation. So let's think about further aspects of um, the political context in which Petrarch was writing. Petrarch was no fan of the Germans, although a good, there is a good degree of inconsistency in his attitudes towards the people north of the Alps. For example, he referred to the Holy Roman Emperor Frederick II, who ruled in the first half of the 13th century as a what, and I quote, a wise prince of German origin, but Italian in spirit, end quote. Yet, on the other hand, he also refers to Germany as a barbarous land. In Petrarch's own time, German mercenaries were being used in local conflicts between Italian lords in the north of the country, and it's something to which, and this is something to which Petrarch was vehemently opposed. He described, he, uh, he uh, described this in one of his Italian poems, referring to Germans as, and again, I quote, a people without laws whose flank, as we read, was pierced by Marius, end quote. 
Marius was a Roman consul who fought against uh, who fought a series of wars against Germanic tribes at the end of the second century BCE. And it's his descendants of these, and it's the descendants of these same tribes who are now fighting in Italy at Bund Petra. On the other hand, when the Holy Roman Emperor Charles IV journeyed to Rome in 1354-1355, Petrarch, in the hope that a um, Roman emperor might once again reside in Rome, portrayed him as a modern-day Scipio. Although Charles IV was of Bohemian origins, his status as the Ro Holy Roman Emperor must be seen as situating him in close association with the territories of what is now Germany. German otherness, then, is highly contingent in Petrarch's thinking. Even if Germans are set apart on the basis of their nationhood, they cannot, however, be said to be truly racialist. Numerous elements of Petrarch's vision of empire, as presented in the Scipio's Dream of the Africa, can, however, I suggest, be characterized as racialized. These are Petrarch's representations of Christianity's perceived Muslim and Jewish enemies as Rome's enemies. This is rooted in Petrarch's representation of the war against Carthage as a clash of civilizations. Scipio's father represents the coming battle of Zama, at which Scipio defeated Hannibal as a conflict between good and evil. The absolute evilness of the Carthaginian commander Hannibal is emphasized through frequent reference to his dishonesty, his cruelty, and his perfidy, adapted from Livy's description of the Carthaginian commander as possessing uh, more than Punic perfidy, perfidia plus quam punica. Perfidia was a word that had highly charged meaning in the 14th century. As uh, Ronald Martinez shows, in 1348, the decade of the first phase of the Africa's composition, a papal call was promulgated uh, entitled Quam Westudeorum Perfidiam, although the, perfidious, uh, the perfidy of the Jews. Uh, papal bulls generally take their name from the first few words of the bull. The bull addresses Christian suspicions that the Black Death was being spread by Jewish communities in Europe. The suspicion that the bull aims to dispel, although acknowledging the legitimate hatred the Christians might feel for what the bull refers to as the perfidy of the Jews. In the 19th and 20th centuries, numerous scholars and authors have viewed Carthage as a Semitic city, Semitic very much in scare quotes, due to the Near Eastern origins of its Phoenician settlers. For example, the 19th century French historian Jules Michelet referred to Carthaginians as an impure race. The Punic Wars determining which civilization would prevail, what Michelet refers to as the Indo Germanic Romans or Semitic Carthage. The Africa plays an important role in the burgeoning racialization of Carthage as Semitic, representing the Punic city as not only hostile to ancient Rome, but in Book 7, the Catholic Church, which would later be centered on uh, the imperial city. Such links between Roman antiquity and the non Christian world are made explicit in another one of Petrarch's texts is De Vita Solitaria, On Solitary Life. Here, Petrarch explains Muslim antipathy towards Rome by claiming that the prophet Muhammad bore a grudge against Romans, and I quote, recalling the great number of defeats and serious misfortunes that had been inflicted by Rome at different times on the Persians, the Medes, the Egyptians, Chaldeans, and his prophet Muhammad's Arab ancestors, end quote. Notably, Carthage is absent from this gallery of Eastern Roman uh, enemies. This is because it's more associated with Judaism than Islam for the reasons that I mentioned uh, just a bit earlier. Petrarch's explanation for the conflicts between the Latin West and the world beyond through reference to Roman antiquity can therefore be seen as a unifying feature of his historical imaginary that runs through uh, his corpus from Africa to his day reached solitarium. Petrarch's epic framing of this binary opposition between the Latin West and the East since he was almost as anti uh, antipathetic towards the Greek Orthodox Church as he was towards Islam and Judaism, contributed to later humanist views of the Islamic East, particularly after the Ottoman capture of Constantinople, as the mortal enemy of both the Church and of classicism. Such conceptions of the relationship between humanism and the Muslim world also contributed to shaping ideas of the Renaissance as a self-enclosed European phenomenon, alighting the contribution to scholars in, in uh, the Islamic world, as well as Jewish scholars, the transmission of ancient Greek texts. As in the Aeneid, Augustus' civil wars are represented in Scipio's dream as wars of external conquest. In the Aeneid, Augustus' victory over Mark Antony at Actium in 31 BCE is represented as defeat of a monstrous orient led by Antony's Egyptian wife, Cleopatra. In Scipio's dream, he is told that uh, Scipio is told that Augustus will bring the Indus under Roman laws and will capture fierce Egypt, 
this Egypt being Aegyptus Theros. Um, it was, uh, Scipio hears that Augustus will defeat the wife of the Latin leader, who is depicted as shaking her barbarian sister, the, um, the, rattlers, the rattles used by worshippers of Isis. Cleopatra is shown also rattling her sister in the shield of Aeneas and book Eight of the Aeneid, where India also features among the allies of Egypt, contributing to a generalized picture of East versus West. Therox, meaning fierce and describing Egypt, is a, word, is a word used by Petrarch in the Africa to refer exclusively to non-Italians, except for when referring to um, Sulla, the tyrannical antagonist of, of a civil war, whose fratricidal conflicts lead Petrarch to represent him as non-Roman, or at least anti-Roman. The only specific example of Roman imperial triumph drawn from the period of the Principate is the sack of Jerusalem. This uh, took place during uh, Jewish wars uh, in the first century, and this allows Petrarch to restate his own anti-Jewish commitments. The plundering of the Temple of Jerusalem is represented by Petrarch as divine retribution against the Jewish people. And this clearly has crusading connotations, with Jerusalem rightfully belonging to Christendom rather than to Judaism or indeed to Islam. Elsewhere, Petrarch explicitly points to the execution of Christ as the sin of the Jewish people and positions Vespasian and Titus as Christ's avengers whom Petrarch wishes to recall from the dead in order to avenge Christ again, presumably again against uh, Judaism. The grandeur that was Rome declines when power passes into the hands of foreigners, especially foreigners of the race of Spain and Africa, which who Petrarch describes as the filth of humanity, the shameful survivors of our sort, end quote. These representatives of the filth of mankind must be the emperors Trajan, Hadrian and Septimius Severus, as well as their dynasties. The word that Petrarch used to describe, uh, to, the word that is translated as race is stirps, uh, which can mean root, stock, or indeed race. This has clearly racialized connotations. For example, the papal bull, as I mentioned earlier, refers to the Judaica stirps, the Jewish race. Geraldine Heng argues that the Crusades of the Holy Land, beginning in the 11th century, coincided with the growth of anti-Jewish violence in Europe and contributed to the congealing of an identity of uh, homo europaeus, European man. In the context of the holy wars overseas and holy violence against Europe's Jewish populations, blood, that of Christian martyrs built in the Middle East, and that of persecuted Jews uh, shed in Europe, was central to the formation of racial identities structured along religious lines. Petrarch applies such proto-biological racial thinking to probably a Scipio's words about Africans and Spaniards. For these races, these survivors of Roman aggression, to grasp the levers of power is especially shocking to the Scipios. Publius Cornelius's horror is amplified by Petrarch's own context of foreigners occupying seats of power traditionally centered on Rome and Romans. A French pope had taken papacy to France, and the close approximation to a, German, uh, to a Roman emperor was the German. Further, Septimius Severus is characterized as a persecutor of Christians by church historians such as Eusebius. Furthermore, his son Caracalla promulgates an edict in 212 uh, CE, which granted Roman citizenship to all free men of the empire, uncoupling the idea of Rome from any sense of an Italian proto-nation. This um, edict would later be cited in Italian fascist historiography in the 1930s as the beginning of the decline of the empire. Yet, despite the degraded states of Rome since the Spanish and African filth of humanity had grasped Rome's imperial scepter, Publius Cornelius states that, and I quote, Latin honor lives and will always be called by the name of the Roman Empire. However, a Roman ruler will not always hold the reins. End quote. Instead, soft Syria, Syria Mollis, harsh Gaul, loquacious Greece, and Illyricum will all take turns ruling Rome until at last power falls to Boreas, the north, by which Petrarch, of course, means Germany. The characterization of Syria as soft falls into Petrarch's wider anti-Arab rhetoric. For example, in a letter to a Paduan doctor friend, Petrarch rails against Arabic poetry, saying that there is, and I quote, nothing more fawning, nothing softer, and the Latin for soft is mollius, and nothing more annoying. Petrarch would no doubt have received such characterizations of Arabs as soft from Latin authors such as Catullus, who also described Arabs as the same word, mollus, or soft. One might object that these transhistorical trans identifications made by Petrarch between Carthage and Jews and Rome's Eastern enemies and Muslims 
does not amount to race thinking. Where, for example, is the emphasis on phenotype found in most conceptualizations of race? So now I'll turn to a final example from the Africa where physical appearance does play a part in Petrarch's thinking on race, although not perhaps in the way that we might expect. The fifth book of the Africa focuses on the story of a love affair between the Carthaginian noblewoman Sophonisba and a Numidian king called Masinissa. The broad outline of this story, as told by Petrarch in the Africa, is as follows. Sophonisba was the daughter of Hasdrubal, a Carthaginian general who fought against Rome during the Second Punic War. She was married to the Numidian king Syphax, who was at first allied, at this time, allied to Rome, or at least initially allied to Rome. However, under the influence of his marriage to Sophonisba, uh, Syphax switches to the Carthaginian side. Uh, in 203 BCE, Syphax is defeated by Masinissa, another Numidian king. Um, at this stage of the war, Masinissa is allied to Rome. Uh, Mas uh, Numidia is broadly where Algeria is today, and parts of Tunisia. So after defeating, um, after defeating Syphax, Masinissa enters uh, Syphax's capital, Kerta, and there meets Sophonisba. Sophonisba begs Masinissa not to hand her over to the Romans, to which Masinissa agrees, and in order to protect Sophonisba, marries her. However, Scipio prevails upon his Numidian ally Masinissa to remember his loyalty to Rome and to give Sophonisba up to the Romans in order to be paraded in triumph. However, in order to keep his word, both Scipio and Sophonisba, Masinissa has poison sent to his new wife, which she willingly accepts as a wedding gift, drinking it to avoid the shame of capture. Petrarch also narrates this story in his biography of Scipio in his De Weiris Illustribus, the, the anthology of famous men from biblical and classical antiquity, as I mentioned at the beginning. The accounts given by Petrarch in both these texts are based closely on that of Roman historian Livy. Now, there are diverging readings of the Sophonisba of the Africa, with Craig Callendorf, for example, describing her as an evil character by the Africa standards, while Donald Gilman rehabilitates her to an extent and suggests that she demonstrates many of the virtues for which Scipio is also praised, namely devotion to her homeland and devotion to her father. It seems difficult to maintain that she is to be read in a positive light, given that she is introduced in the Africa as a Malafida Regina, uh, a queen of bad faith or faithless queen. Masinissa meets Sophonisba on the threshold in Limine of, her, of Syphax's palace in Kerta. Throughout its narration in the Africa, Masinissa's affair with Sophonisba is narrated in terms of crossing boundaries. After defeating Syphax and meeting Sophonisba on the threshold of the palace, Masinissa passes the secreta Limina, the secret thresholds of the palace's innermost chambers. Scipio, when prevailing upon Masinissa to forsake his relationship with, uh, with Sophonisba, speaks in the same terms referring to the ruinous pleasure of this forbidden love, which is able to bypass any boundary or, sorry, any barrier or armed boundaries, and armed boundaries being ferrata uh, which isn't unfortunately on the slide. At the end of book five, Sophonisba, uh, after Sophonisba's suicide, we see her in the underworld, hesitating on the threshold, and the threshold here being sub ipso limina, on the very threshold, an infernal reflection of where she first meets Masinissa on the threshold of the Palace of Curtain. The emphasis on Sophonisba's liminality draws attention to her transgressive nature and her power to subvert social relations, as emphasized, as emphasized by Petrarch's repetition of the trope found in Livy of the conqueror, Masinissa, being captivated by the captive, Sophonisba. Sophonisba and Masinissa are bound by a wild love, the Latin word for that being ferus amor. The ferus is a word most commonly used in the Africa to describe Hannibal or to describe war itself thus highlighting the threatening, dangerous nature of their attraction. Sophonisba's subversiveness and liminality are further emphasized by the description of her appearance when Masinissa first encounters her. Petrarch's description of, of her appearance moves from her head down to down her body, at, thus following the general format of descriptions from uh, Renaissance love poetry. So I'm going to read the description at some length. Um, just because it's important to the point I'm trying to make. And so I'm quoting. Uh, With its snowy whiteness, her brow was enough to astonish Jupiter on high, and much more worrying for his jealous sister uh, than the beauty of any adulteress, pleasing to an unfaithful husband. Brighter than any gold and put the sun's rays to shame, her hair flowed down, spread by a light breeze over her neck, which rose gradually in a straight line. Her hair, falling, covered her slender shoulders, 
and was then bound up carefully with smooth gold and tied in a pleasing way. In this way, or thus, gentle whiteness joined with the dignity of gold, and the golden strands of hair fell into vessels of milk, the changeless snow lying beneath, beneath the rays of a bright sun. So for the first time in any of uh, the literature which describes Sophonisba, she's explicitly described as having white skin and blonde hair. While Candida, the Latin word to describe Sophonisba, could also be translated as shining, fair or beautiful, the comparison with milk and snow makes it clear that we are to understand Sophonisba as having pale skin. And elsewhere in Petrarch's corpus, Candidus is explicitly contrasted with blackness. So we are very much encouraged to view Candida as meaning white. However, despite this description of softness that is physically attractive by normative 14th century standards, there is something deeply sinister about her characterization. In spite of her somatic whitewashing, Petrarch is unable to fully suppress the fact of softness but Africanity. When introducing softness but in terms of her physical beauty, Petrarch refers to her glance as being capable of turning hearts into, and I quote, reduced in marble, such that the African lands did not lack a second monster. So not only is Sophonisba adjacent to monstrosity, Medusa, but this is an African monstrosity since Petrarch follows classical authors in place of Medusa's place of origin in Africa. Moreover, as further proof of Sophonisba's sinister nature, she curses Scipio as she is about to drink her cup of poison at the end of Book 5, and curses Massinissa too if he remains faithful in his allegiance to Rome. In Virgil's Aeneid, the Carthaginian queen Dido foretells the coming of the nameless Punic Avenger, Hannibal, who will rise from her bones against Rome. And this is obviously the subject of the Africa, the Second Punic War, Hannibal's war against uh, Rome, and thus Dido's curse or prophecy coming true. In a similar way, Sophonisba curses Massinissa's family to infer the internal strife, predicting his descendants, his, his descendant Jugurtha's eventual defeat at the hands of the Roman general Marius. Both Marius and Jugurtha, however, remain unnamed in, Scipio, in, in Sophonisba's prophecy. But by emulating Dido's curse, Petrarch makes Sophonisba represent the most dangerous elements of Virgil's Dido. But what then does this have to do with race, especially since Sophonisba's appearance is consciously whitewashed and Europeanized? Petrarch's representation of Sophonisba and Massinissa's romance highlights anxieties around miscegenation. Although Carthage was founded by migrants from the, Leva, uh, from, from the Levant and is thus see, frequently seen as not being properly African in classical Latin texts such as the Aeneid, Petrarch frequently conflates Carthage and Africa. Thus for Massinissa, the Numidian, to, to be romantically involved with the Carthaginian does not automatically trouble any proto-racial boundaries. In order to represent this romance as the threat that it is, both to Massinissa's character and to his allegiance to Rome, the attraction exerted by Sophonisba on Massinissa has to be made to be subversive. This subversion comes in the form of crossing boundaries, as we saw in the frequent uh, reference to um, boundaries in the description of uh, Sophonisba and Massinissa's affair, but also boundaries such as proto-racial ones. Numidian alterity, when compared with Romans, is emphasized. Petrarch, in keeping with his classical sources, presents them as fickle and hypersexual, contrast with Scipio's pious chasteness. Carthaginians are other, uh, but mainly due to their perfidy and their cruelty. However, in order to accentuate the boundary crossing subversiveness of Scipio, uh, of Sophonisba and Massinus's affair, as well as to emphasize Sophonisba's attractiveness, she is made to be white and to have blonde hair. Although Massinissa is not explicitly described as having darker skin, a well-traveled 14th century Italian such as Petrarch would have known that North Africans generally have darker complexions than Italians. Thus, Massinissa's phenotypic alterity is to be taken for granted, whereas Sophonisba's whiteness is not, hence the extended description of her physical appearance. Indeed, in later Renaissance visual depictions of Sophonisba, she is shown as being white and is contrasted with darker-skinned Carthaginians and Numidians. She's also shown as being dressed in European fashion, whereas the, uh, the male Carthaginians and Numidians are shown dressed as Ottomans. This also corresponded with a general reframing of her story during the later Renaissance and the Baroque periods to shape her into being an innocent victim of tragic love rather than a subversive scheme. So finally, why does any of this matter? At the beginning of this paper, I suggested that the importance of humanism, I, I suggest the importance of humanism for conceptions of the human. 
We've heard of the esteem in which later humanists held Petrarch as an intellectual forebear and the place of Petrarch's writing, and the Africa in particular, in this perception. Humanists and Petrarch in particular are frequently seen as the first moderns due to their self-awareness of living at, on the threshold of a new era. This is also seen as a new era of classical revival, accompanied by the hopes for the rebirths of the achievements of the Roman Empire. Humanity in this period began to be conceptualized not simply along the lines of Christian and non-Christian, but classical and non-classical. The secularization of categories of self and other saw an increasing emphasis on the, reason, on the capacity of reason. Classical peoples were considered rational, non-classical peoples not. The decolonial scholar Sylvia Winter saw the Renaissance as a period of the emergence of a new conception of the human, which she terms homo politicus. Homo politicus is defined as a rational subject and began to displace previous models of humans as primarily religious subjects. It was this political scientific conceptualization of humanity which laid the groundwork for secular accounts of race, which allowed for the genocide of indigenous peoples in the so-called New World, the enslavement of Africans, and the scientific racism, which would lead to the crematoria of Auschwitz. Now, I'm not suggesting that Petrarch's Africa bears witness to any decisive rupture in between otherness on the basis of religion and otherness on the basis of scientific categories of race or pseudo-scientific categories of race. However, we do see in it an important step in the development of race thinking. The secularization of Christianity and the Christianization of pagan antiquity allowed Petrarch to imbue his vision of Roman imperialism with the language of crusades, with all its blood spilling, community forming connotations. Making Rome's enemies Christianity's enemies and vice versa, these religious prejudice applied anachronistically. This can only be possible if you see, for example, Judaism and Islam in racial terms, rather than on the basis of actual religious practice. The Sophonisba story shows a concern for crossing boundaries, which I suggest betrays burgeoning anxieties around miscegenation, marriage between uh, races. These elements would coalesce into a more coherent racial ideology in the following century during the Spanish Inquisition and the plundering and subjugation of the Americas. However, it's not only in the context of the development of early modern race thinking that the Africa matters. It's a poem that saw intense and renewed popularity in fascist Italy, as I mentioned at the beginning of my talk. Petrarch was heralded as an Italian proto-nationalist and even a proto-fascist. His championing of Roman revival allowed Mussolini's regime to present Petrarch as a spiritual predecessor of the fascist movement. Fascism used the idea of ancient Rome to promote empire and antiquity, uh, to, to, to promote empire and the antiquity and excellence of the Italian people. Here following directly in the tradition of uh, Petrarch's project in the Africa. At this moment of rising racist nationalisms across the world and imperialisms, it's important to historicize the development of concepts such as nation and race. Yes, I've just been talking about why Petrarch's Latin epic is an important uh, document in the development of European racial thinking. It also offers a key text in the process of, uh, of centering the human within the universe, opening the door, opening the door for thinking that uh, for thinking that tells us that humans are in charge of their own destiny. The Italianist and scholar of Renaissance literature, Aldo Bernardo, described the Africa as the birth of humanism's dream. Now in the week of the centenary of Mussolini's March on Rome, it's time to revisit this birth and to recover the dream, uh, to recover Scipio's dream uh, before we descend into the nightmare of, hum uh, before we descend into a nightmare of human making. Thank you very much. Thank you.